uh, this gentleman is a very dynamic speaker, and that's why we ask him to come come by all the time. Mr. Rob Aiken from Arm, right here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa. Okay, so we have an agenda. You have to listen to the talk, and then you get the prize, as I understand it. Those seem to be the rules. So we're clearly going to talk about the IoT and uh, machine learning, but we also want to talk about communication, because that turns out to be a key driver for why you might want to actually do embedded machine learning. And then, you know, why would you do that? Well, you want to beat your coffee pot, don't you? So... If you, if you want to sort of zone out and look at your phone for the next half hour, the, the uh, message is embedded machine learning is feasible. You can do it. Okay. So first we want to separate the hope from the hype. This is the Gardner hype cycle. You'll notice that both IoT and machine learning are sitting right there on the top. I also uh, took a look at Google Trends to see who's looking for machine learning. It's uh, sort of the bluish countries there. You can see India and China are looking for it quite a bit. So, well, well, how do we separate it? Well, first of all, let's look at some hype. So here's some hype. We'll have a trillion sensors in 10 years. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Here's how you get there. You get there by making large numbers grow quickly. Okay, that's fine. Could you actually get to a trillion? Well, you could, and if you, if you like tables, you can work out the various cumulative growth rates and so on, but there's basically, conceivably, it's possible to get to a trillion things. Okay, that's neat. When will it happen? Well, sometime. But really the point is not whether it'll happen this week, next week, 10 years, or 50 years. Really the point is that a large-scale IoT system has got a huge number of things in it and that the things require some certain properties. They have to be automated. You can't just be doing them manually if you're in hundreds of billions or trillions of things. Okay, good. Well, first of all, if there's going to be a trillion sensors, are there a trillion things at all? That's a good question. It turns out there are, but you have to include consumables. So there's 400 billion beverage containers manufactured every year, for example. Um, there's 100 billion sheets of paper that people use to print. Even in our paperless offices, we're still doing a lot of printing. If everybody had 140 things, that would work out to be a trillion. So yeah, we can get to large numbers is really the point of this. Fine. What do we do with that? Well, let's find out. So where do the trillions live? The trillions in an Internet of Things world are really the things. So your smart toaster or your smart coffee maker or whatever. These things will communicate primarily by radio to some kind of gateway device, whether that's a phone or a Wi-Fi or something. And those communicate again via additional wireless networks into the cloud and the fog. At each of these red lines, there's a bandwidth point. And so minimizing the communication across that is really key to making things work. There are also all sorts of other limits. There's energy limits here and there. There are dollar limits. So we want to figure out what the limits are and how we work through them. We also have to figure out what these things are going to do. So the usual thing, if somebody says, well, in the future, everything will be intelligent. Well, so what will it do? I don't know. Let's find out. But you can see that, that there are lots of avenues for intelligent things. There's healthcare is a, is a major one. There's lots of opportunities there, smart factories, smart cities, and so on. So it's not just, we don't just have to make elect, you know, intelligent toasters. We can have additional things as well. Smart farming is another area that's potentially highly automatable. Okay. So if you want to know how to do IoT, this is the algorithm. So this is you just do this, now you've got an IoT system. So you have a sensor, the sensor does gathers data, it does something with it, and it sends it somewhere. And it just does that forever. Meanwhile, in the cloud, the cloud gets data from all of these different places, it does some more analysis on it, and then it decides to do something with it. And there's the optional actuator. So you don't necessarily have to physically do anything, you could just learn something. But you could say, oh, it looks like my smart farm could use some water. Let's turn on the water. So the optional actuator actually implements instructions from the app. So that's it. That's the whole IoT. There's only seven lines of code if it's written in a suitably high-level language. OK. There's, a, there's interesting applications out there. This is one that Amazon has set up. It's uh, the Internet of Baseball. So every time, on every play, there's 2,000 samples per second. There's cameras all over the place. They feed it off into the cloud. 
12 seconds later, they can analyze the play, and in this particular case, they could say, you know, that guy really shouldn't have dove for first base. That was a bad idea. He should have kept on running. He would have been safe. But the, So at one level, 12 seconds is pretty quick turnaround time. The other thing, though, is how fast is that? Is that real time? In baseball, 12 seconds is not really real time. If you're the outfielder and you think, okay, oh, he seems to hit the ball. Oh, wait for the cloud here. The cloud says I should have run for the fence and made the catch. Oh, sure enough. <laughs> you know, so, so 12 seconds is not real time if you're playing baseball, but it's close to real time if you're watching it. So that real time has different definitions, and it, again, it's important to the locality of processing. If you want, if you want faster decision making, it needs to be closer to the event. There's another thing, uh, one of the biggest marketing triumphs of the last decade has been deep learning. So, oh, deep, that's deep learning, hmm, deep. So we have a deep thinker, and then we have a deep neural network. The thing that makes that a deep neural network is it has lots of layers, and that's really the only thing that makes it a deep network. So deep learning refers to the depth of the network as opposed to some quality of learning. But again, it's a marketing triumph, note that, for your future. When you start your own company, make sure that you use suitably high quality marketing. What do these things actually do? In a way, they're just like curve fitting. It's just they fit horrendously complicated curves that you couldn't really figure out on your own. So essentially, that's what it is. It's, it's like linear regression, except with a function where you're not quite sure what the function is or the variables. It's, it's really just fitting it and coming up with a descriptor so that given properties of some object, you can interpolate or extrapolate where it fits in a classification scheme. So, okay, cool. So they happen to be very good. Neural nets are very good at approximating very complicated functions, and that's why they're useful for machine learning. All right, so I decided to draw a diagram of some of the IoT at my house just to see kind of where we're at. So I have a bunch of random stuff, and it's connected via a bunch of things. And you'll notice in the picture on the right, the secret hidden backdrop to the IoT. So that's a, a little repeater station. So there were two different things. Uh, the sensor and the receiver allegedly had a 75 foot distance span, but apparently the 75 feet doesn't include things like walls or you know stuff that you might find in someone's house. So 75 feet of open space apparently would work. But anyway, the, the essence of the, there's a couple of interesting things about this besides the general complexity. Number one is there's a huge number of wireless networks. Number two is there's a bunch of different parallel paths into the house. So in the old days, I used to know every piece of information that flowed in and out of my router. Now I have no idea what goes on in there. The, you know, the, the, the thermostat is busy talking to something and the little echo box is talking to something else. And all of these things are talking and they're all running their own you know, secrets and so on. And keeping security on this is a really tricky problem. It used to be that the firewall to your house was sort of a barricade, but now it's not. Now the things inside your house could be attacking themselves or each other. All right, so what's an example of an IoT application? Well, here's one. Video monitoring is one where there's a large amount of data, but there isn't really very much information. So this is the, the view outside my front door, and you'll notice the, the leaves and the sun. So to a motion detector algorithm inside a camera, every time the wind blows, the leaves move, and the camera goes, oh, 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 motion. And then the sun goes behind a cloud, and the, the camera goes, oh, motion. And it does this over and over and over again. So I wound up having to build that little wall, and I aim the camera at the wall and say, here, find motion on the wall because the leaves were too confusing for it. But anyway, what do I actually care about? Well, if my grandson walks out the front door, I might care about that. Or if the UPS guy comes and delivers packages, I might care about that. So that but how much information is that? That's like you know, 100 bytes worth of information, but this camera is generating megabytes per second. It also generates weird horror things at night. So that, that, that's a moth under IR. <laughs> But when you look at what's actually involved in the IoT, there's really there's a, there's a collection of information requirements. So for passive sensing, there really isn't very much information that's required. There's not a lot of processing required. If you're trying to be a little bit more interactive and back a car into a spot, there's a little bit more processing power required. 
Whereas if you want to go fully autonomous, then the processing power is high and the communication needs are high and the, uh, the, the uh, requirement that the system itself be able to maintain its autonomy even in the absence of good communication is important. So there's a, you can see there's a whole range of needs for embedded machine learning depending on what exactly you're trying to do with it. We also want to make sure that we reduce data movement. So we don't want to communicate unnecessarily. And there's a, a quote from a famous political boss that tells you that. We have a, a different set of communication now. So in, in the IoT era, we're mostly doing upload, whereas in the sort of previous eras, there was a lot of download. So TV was download only. Most of your internet, classic internet, is download only. You're watching Netflix or whatever. IoT is mostly a bunch of data going upstream. You can see different changes or uh, different requirements for upload and download depending on what you're doing. And basically, communication in the IoT involves reducing these huge data sets. So. Again, this is another hype curve, which in this case, depending on where you look, you can find that the requirements for the IoT are greater than all previous communication systems in history at the low end, or greater than all communication systems in history squared at the high end. So really, there's a, there's a lot of bandwidth that these systems will potentially use. One way around that is this idea of fog-based compute. So the, the fog, as you if you haven't figured this out, is the, the area between the cloud and the edge. So that's foggy, hence fog compute. It's, it's not as good as deep learning, but it's, it's better than nothing, right? So, but it, it makes you wonder. So remember the baseball example. All that information was being transmitted upstream to some cloud someplace, and then it all came back down. What if that processing was done locally? Most of the 12 seconds is actually communication time. It's not actually processing time. So more, more local processing gives you more real-time capability. We also have the question of how much information is enough. So here we have three pictures. We could train a machine learning tool. And the machine learning tool could say that one's a car, one's a toy car, and the third thing is not a car. So sure, fine. But we could also get more information. So there's more information about each of these things. How much of this information do we really need? And again, it depends on what exactly we're trying to do with it. So specifically, if we go look at neural nets and think, what do we actually have to do with them? We can, we can train them for different things. So here's an example. This was a, a, a guy who uh, got tired of the fact that apparently Caltrain's alleged arrival times and actual arrival times don't have necessarily very much in common. So he programmed himself a video system to point at the tracks ran it through his Raspberry Pi, and it tells him whether there's a, a Caltrain on the track, a freight train on the track, light rail, or trucks. And so using that, he's able to train his system up to, do, to find out when the train is coming. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Maybe we can look into this. So what else, what's involved in this? Well, part of it is how complicated do these neural nets be? So need to be. Neural nets tend to have weights on them. How many bits are necessary in precision for those weights? So um, ARM Research did an experiment on this, and other people have done some similar things, where we looked at different w numbers of bits in the weights to solve specific problems. And you can see that there's kind of a minimum level, which, say, for SqueezeNet and AlexNet is about four bits before it starts doing anything. And then about two bits of precision later, then it's basically as good as infinite precision. So there's a, there's a real possibility of simplifying neural networks considerably if you take a look at what they actually need to do. Part of this is, so there's the deployment aspect, there's also the training aspect. So the, the, uh, the point of the, the training example there is uh, those glasses on the bottom were developed by Carnegie Mellon specifically to fool face recognition algorithms. So what they did was they took different types of glasses and then they fed them into machine learning. They used machine learning to figure out which glasses would be better at defeating machine learning. And so they came up with the glasses on the bottom. So if you wear those, the face detector software at your friendly neighborhood airport probably won't figure out who you are. Interesting. Oops, went the wrong way. There we go. Okay, so I thought, well, if, 
you know, if, if uh, poets can do neural nets, I could probably do this because even though I'm a bad poet, I could probably still follow the directions. So I tried it. The, I used the same technique the guide used for his train thing. So I used it on my bushes and people problem. So I trained it again. I trained it on a, a set of images of bushes and some people. And I can now actually do a fairly good job of distinguishing people and non-people. I've got about 99% recognition. The two pictures there are two of the ambiguous cases. So it wasn't sure whether either of those two things are a person. So <laughs> nonetheless, there we go. So again, we could probably get it to recognize birds, and then it would speed up a bit. All right, so what else is going on in this? So we've, got, we've kind of taken a look at some of the the technological requirements, we also have to think about resilience. So when you think, it, when you have a, a, an object, the fact that it works or it doesn't work to most of the users, they don't particularly care whether it doesn't work because of a software bug, a design flaw, something that's you know failed electronically. They just think the thing doesn't work, it's turned into garbage, now I have to throw it away. And not only that, I'm never buying from that. I'm going back to chip estimate and I'm gonna find the other three companies and pick them. So, we have a trust and security issue as well. So, so trust is actually the opposite of security. So, in a, in a truly secure system, you trust no one and nothing. So, we notice, though, that if you don't trust anyone ever, there's a lot of overhead involved. So, we want to avoid that. Trust, trust is kind of an analog scale. So, I might trust you all to look after my backpack here while I go and get a coffee and you might trust me to do the same. You probably wouldn't trust me to just hold on to the pin for your bank account and you might not trust me with your car keys. Well, so you, there's a sort of a scale for how much we trust people. However, all human systems that work rely on trust. So when we think about a trillion objects, we have to have some level of trust baked into it and we have to figure out how to do that and do that in an automated way. So again, there's, there's research approaches to that and there are various solutions to it. We do want to, at some point though, we want to replicate this without being naive. So an example of a naive system, I, I was looking at my camera system since it's my favorite IoT subject of the day, and it said if you get your password wrong five times in a row, then it will lock you out of the system. Oh, okay, that's a nice security feature. How do I get back in? Oh, call us for a special password. Hmm, a special password. So anyone with a special password can get into my system regardless of what I do. Yeah. All right. So is that naive? I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. Okay. So kind of in conclusion here, so we can all get our prizes. I don't think everyone gets one, though, but... Uh, so ma machine learning is really a key part of the IoT control loop. So remember, the, both the devices themselves, if they do some machine learning, they can actually reduce their communication needs dramatically, which can then free up additional bandwidth and improve the performance of the cloud systems overall. We can use simplified neural nets. We don't necessarily have to use horrendously complicated ones. The, the train spotting thing runs on a Raspberry Pi, so that's a, that's a very complicated neural net. You could have a much simpler one running on a microcontroller. You could have a, a microcontroller with an accelerator and so on. So there's a lot, of, a lot of capability there. Resilience, security, and trust are all important. And uh, that, that's pretty much it for now. So thank you.